This is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Charges are being dropped against the president and CEO of Indian Collective, Nick Tilson. Tilson was among more than 200 indigenous people and allies protesting former President Trump's visit to the Black Hills in South Dakota. Trump went to Mount Rushmore for an Independence Day event in the middle of the pandemic. The Lakota have long tried to get the land back based on the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. Tilson and other treaty defenders gathered on the highway leading into Mount Rushmore and blocked the road for three hours. In response, law enforcement officers and Air and National Guard members were called in, leading to a skirmish between the land defenders and officers. Tilson was arrested and was charged with a combination of misdemeanors and felonies. He could have faced up to 17 years in prison. Tilson says he will participate in a prison diversion program in exchange for all but one charge against him being dropped. That final charge will be dropped once he completes the program. The director of the American Indian Center at the University of North Carolina is stepping down. Dr. Larry Chavez says there isn't enough funding. When we help that along any part of the process, we're, we're helping our state, we're helping our country, we're helping our communities. And, and I think not enough of the biggest, our biggest donors know about that. You know, each school on campus, the athletic departments, they have a key set of donors and we don't have access to those donors. We're kind of expected to raise money from our own communities, but our communities are like, we've been devastated. Like the impact of settler colonialism is that our wealth is a fraction of what it would have been otherwise. The American Indian Center is a place where Native students can get resources and help for themselves and their communities. Dr. Chavez says it needs more support from UNC. Up to 90 percent of the center's funding goes directly to help students create community projects, lead after-school programs, and manage community gardens for tribes. In Winnipeg, Canada, an Indigenous men's support group is banding together to place red ribbons on the Maryland Bridge in honor of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited individuals. The group Healing Together replaced ribbons taken down from the bridge. The tying of red ribbons to bridges began as a grassroots campaign several years ago in Winnipeg. Each ribbon represents an Indigenous woman who has lost her life or one who is still missing. The campaign is not limited to Winnipeg. There are other bridges in the region and even some in the United States, all bearing the telltale sign of red cloth material. The North Dakota Indian Affairs Commission is calling for, a non, for nominations for candidates to be inducted into this year's Hall of Fame. The Native American Hall of Fame honors and recognizes Indigenous Americans who make significant impact representing their tribe or culture. The program recognizes contemporary and traditional achievements in arts and culture, athletics, and leadership. The nomination applications are available at indianaffairs.gov, and the deadline to submit is April 5th. In September, an honoring for this year's recipients will take place at United Tribes Technical College's International Powwow. Indigenous elders are among the first Australians to be inoculated against COVID-19 as part of the early phase of the country's vaccine rollout. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders over 55 years old and living in remote areas now have priority under Australia's vaccination plan. Members of the indigenous community in the town of Madura in Victoria are now receiving AstraZeneca coronavirus shots. Jackie Turfey, who works with Aboriginal Services, explains why indigenous Australians are such a highly vulnerable group. That typically Aboriginal people are a more vulnerable cohort to COVID-19 and the worst outcomes from that as a result of chronic um, health issues, chronic disease. Uh, we have higher rates of chronic disease in our communities. Australia has vaccinated about 200,000 people so far and has plans to import and manufacture 70 million doses of the AstraZeneca shot. The country has, among, has been among the most successful countries in the world in containing community spread of the disease. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalohungva. And when we come back, what happens when a physician comes down with the coronavirus? Mark? Hi, Patty. Well, for one, a doctor, it was about to take a fight that took months for him to get well enough home. We'll speak with Dr. Grant Lashley when we come back.
Throughout the pandemic, there has been a lot of concern about the safety of healthcare workers, and rightly so. They are on the front lines and have close personal contact with COVID positive patients. That's what Dr. Grant Lashley faced as he started seeing patients who were sick with the coronavirus. Last April, Dr. Lashley started feeling ill. A test revealed that he was COVID positive. That started an ordeal that is still ongoing. He was hospitalized and then intubated for 39 days. And at one point, his wife was asked if she would remove him from life support. Well, that didn't happen. And rec he recovered enough to be sent home where he's still recovering. Dr. Lashley joins us now to tell us what it was like as a doctor to now be a patient. Welcome, Dr. Lashley. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, what an extraordinary journey. Well, you could say that. <laughs> extraordinary and scary. Maybe walk us through what, how it all started and uh, the process. Well, sure. Um, you know, we were all learning about the COVID. It was coming into more of a common thing that we're starting to hear about in the news. We knew it was in our area. Um, and so each day we'd go to the, our, the ER at nights. And each night we'd discuss with the staff the plan. Everybody stay safe. Everybody wash their hands. Wear as much of the personal protective equipment as we could. Uh, but treat every patient like they may have it because it's invisible. You don't see it. You don't know who has it, you know, until a test comes positive. So that's the way we went after it to keep our, our whole staff. And my, my group really worked well as a team, but we, our plan was to keep everybody safe, not just the doctors, but the nurses staff, the housekeeping staff, the laboratory staff. So, you know, once again, uh, our area hadn't really tested positive yet. Nearby areas had. We knew it was coming. And then over the next couple of weeks, we, we started having some positive tests. Once again, I would be called upstairs to the ICU for somebody who had passed away from COVID-19. And um, you know, during that time period, they're breathing heavy, they're actually dying. And so, but the virus stays in the air for a little while. And, and so it's still there. So we had rules and regulations about waiting to go in after you know, somebody expired. But once again, the virus was still there. And once again, I'm not sure at the time period we had the best personal protective equipment yet, but we had what we had the time what we could use. So, you know, one, each day at work was a little scary thing. My wife's a physician as well, and we'd have the family talk. Mom and dad are trying to stay safe. Mom and dad are trying to protect the family and each other uh, from this. So we'd take our clothes off at night when we get home. We'd, you know, you know sanitize all of our uh, lab coats and scrubs and clothes and shoes. Um, but once again, you know, as I told my wife, you know, we're not ones that run away from a fight. So when it came to us, we were ready, we we're after it. And I, I wouldn't have changed that now. Um, so at the time, you know, I had, had a time where I was, I intubated a patient that was COVID. I pronounced the guy that was upstairs with COVID. And within days, everybody that was exposed to this gentleman who was 99 years old uh, came down positive. I intubated his house, or his sitter, who was in her 70s the next day, several family members. So whatever strain or whatever, production he had of the virus was very virulent so very strong and um once again over the next couple of days week or so i feel about seven o'clock at night i tell my wife i feel bad but i don't have a fever i'm not coughing but i just don't feel good and uh by morning i feel a little bit better and so i go about my day and about seven o'clock at night and do it again after a couple of days my wife said listen there's something not right about this maybe you have the flu or maybe you have something going on and i was getting ready to go into a long work weekend so you know i just said let's get tested be safe and so um you know, i went and we got tested uh flu was negative uh actually strep uh in the back of the throat was positive uh but so was covid19 and so you know i said well i don't feel bad so i just i rot it out at home it's not a big deal i'll just self-quarantine you know keep my distance from you and the kids y'all stay on the other side of the house and um but each once again at nighttime i started getting chills which started feeling a little bit bad and I did start getting a little great temperature. And so finally, my wife said, listen, I don't want to go through a weekend like this, especially with you, you know, I'm just coming off a long work time. Let's go get you, check out everything, make sure we're okay lab-wise and everything else. So we went to the emergency department and the chest X-ray had what's called a ground glass appearance all over the chest X-ray. It's a little different than pneumonia. Um, so, you know, because of what was happening, you know, my oxygen saturation at the time, I didn't feel bad but my oxygen saturation should be above 94, 94 up to 100. That's a normal range for any normal person. 
but mine, even when I felt was feeling good, was staying around 90. It's a little too low. So, you know, we just decided to go ahead and um, talk to the radiologist. They said, let's get a, a CT scan, look at your lungs real well, make sure we're not missing something. And so they did a, uh, they did a chest, uh, excuse me, uh, CAT scan and CT. And they, they once again saw a lot of this ground glass appearance, um, which we now know sort of goes along with COVID. And um, so I, I talked to my wife and she said, listen, you know, I know you don't feel bad, but your saturations are a little bit low. Let's be safe and go with a COVID unit at a local hospital and be watched for a day. And then you can come home and quarantine. I said, well, you're, you know, you're the boss. So uh, we, we went to, the, to that and uh, within 24 hours of being there, my saturation started drop dropping. They went down to around low 80s. And that's when they came and said, everything's changed. You need to be put on a ventilator. And um, so the, the nice doctor came up from the emergency department and, and um, you know, said, it's got to be done. And my response was, no, my wishes are not to be intubated. And <laughs> they said, your wife says you're not in your right mind right now. She says, Get, intubate you. So <laughs> that was a big joke we had. But, you know, it was a right decision with three young children. And so um, that's the last I remember for 39 days. They intubated me. And um, once again, that's when, you know, everything changed in my world. But, you know, now retrospectively, what really changed was my family, my wife and my kids now had no dad for the next 39 days. Wow, that's extraordinary. When you think about it, you don't even realize the fight you're having because you're not not present. Correct. You know, during that time period, um, you know, they had to put a tube to breathe for me. It's called a trach. They had, uh, in that time period, I had dialysis twice where they, you know, clean the, clean the blood uh, like they do for uh, kidney patients. They, um, um, I had a stroke. And um, once again, during that time period, what they do is they, put me prone or face down to activate the lower parts of my lungs that would never, that weren't working. Usually when you breathe, you don't use them that much. Um, once again, I don't smoke. I don't have any chronic problems. Was on any medicines before any of this. And so, you know, the hope was that by supporting my breathing, I'd get better, but each day actually I got worse. And um, so my wife kept meeting with the, the specialists. And you know, at the time we said, don't give uh, steroids, which is now the first thing we give people because they thought it would make, uh, the virus uh, more productive and um but once again my things were getting worse the pressure to keep my lungs open was getting harder for the machines and um once again they said you know this is not looking good around mother's day 2020 uh the, the critical care doctor asked my doc my, my wife to please consider taking me off of life support and um well, once again that was a shocker that, wow uh, we only have about a minute left but as a physician, how has this changed your thinking about the disease? And yeah, as a physician, it makes you want to make sure you protect your fa your family first, your staff. Once again, do the things that we know to do. Um, you know, wash your hands, wear your mask, do the things that are very important, um, that that are easy to do and safe to do right now. So, what's it like for patients who can't be around their families during this crisis? Well, I think that that's something we're going to see in time has been very affects many people is, you know, you think about it, you know, people that are sad, lonely, um, there's a lot of depression that goes along with this that increases during this time period, you know, families are in the hospital, but a lot of the support and touch that they need from their family is not available. Um, you have elderly people who are actively dying, who can only see their family on a little computer screen. It's just not the same. I think it makes people very sad. I think once again, it's something that will in time be something we discuss and figure out how to, how to deal with differently. Thank you, Dr. Lashley. Thank you. What a journey. Thank you for joining us and we'll be right back.
From tackling stories on time zone changes to the latest on what the former Assistant Interior Secretary is doing these days, Megan Sullivan is covering the news. She's working in Alaska and joins us now. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. So tell us about the time zone change. Yes. So um, as I'm sure many viewers know, but which is new to me because I'm from the north, Arizona has some unique time zone considerations. Um, the state itself does not observe daylight savings, uh, but Navajo Nation does observe daylight savings. So locals say, you know, in two it could be two different times um, on the opposite sides of the street within the, the region. And recently a bill endorsed this month by the New Mexico State Senate would make it so that the state um, stayed on one time zone instead of following daylight savings. Um, and that's New Mexico, not Arizona. And so if that were the case, if this bill passes through, Navajo Nation is considering following suit and matching New Mexico as well. So then it would leave Utah with the one being on the out as uh, Navajo Nation covers three states. Yeah, I guess so. And, and this, this idea pops up in Alaska too from time to time where people don't like the, the changing time and want one uh, non-daylight savings time. <laughs> Yeah, there's actually a bit of debate um, in Alaska right now about, you know, similar time zone considerations. Some people are for daylight savings and some people are against it. Uh, we'll see where that goes. There's not any legislation currently happening, um, as we see in New Mexico, but maybe farther down the line. Another story that uh, runs today that's pretty significant is a profile of the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, the former Assistant Secretary, Tara Sweeney. Tell us about that story. Yeah, so um, I was able to talk to Tara Sweeney about her time as assistant secretary and we covered many topics. Um, we talked about her different accomplishments during her tenure, what she's proud of, the lessons she's learned. Um, and I'm excited for people to be able to read it because uh, she had a lot to say. She has an extraordinary following in Alaska. She was active with the Alaska Federation of Natives before she took office in the Trump administration and uh, has been involved in a lot of issues. Yeah, um, she's she's a very well-known Alaska Native leader within Alaska. Um, and I think this story gives people an opportunity who might not have been familiar with her beforehand to kind of get to know her a little bit better, um, understand her motivations and her inspirations during um, her, her tenure as assistant secretary. One of the things you get to in the story that I think is so important is that unlike the tribes in the 48, a lot of the Alaska issues are kind of unsettled and particularly the relationship between Alaska Native corporations and uh, village tribal governments. Yeah, and there's ongoing, um, there's ongoing litigation about that right now in courts. Um, so she commented on that and how she navigated that during um, her time as assistant secretary, because that is an ongoing debate that's happening in the state right now. And um, it'll be interesting to see where things end up. And it definitely makes, I think, the process a little bit more complex up here. So she talks about how she navigated that. This, um, in fact, we're coming up and you'll be writing a lot about this in the coming year, but we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which really defines so much of these issues. Yeah, it's an interesting time um, and I'm excited to start reporting on that soon. Megan Sullivan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. A love for culture and a passion for art drives four fashion designers who are all at very different phases in their careers. From Rocky Boy in Montana to Australia, these designers are creating art that has meaning beyond fashion. Karina Dominguez shows us their style and one collection that made it to a runway in Milan. Four indigenous designers are successfully building their brands. Louis Gong is the founder and CEO of Eighth Generation, the first native owned company to produce wool blankets. We work 100% of the time with native artists who are paid for their work. And we also provide business capacity building for artists that we work with. Before that, he was customizing shoes and putting on workshops with the help of vans, which assisted him in raising the seed money for 8th generation. 
Today, the brand is one of the fastest growing native owned companies, but Gong is most proud of the unique merger of art, activism, and business that the company has struck. I set out to create my own system、uh, to develop a new status quo for how companies might work with cultural artists. Eighth Generation has one store in Seattle and another one opening soon in Portland. I'm so excited about native entrepreneurship because I think more and more native people are recognizing that what we bring to the table, you know, the things that we've inherited from our grandmas and grandpas, whether it's our art or the way that we look at the world, is not just valuable beyond the boundaries of our reservations and our communities, it's needed. I'm really proud of the scale that we've achieved. On the other side of the world, Marie Q. Couture was featured during Milan Fashion Week. Cheryl Creed is an Aboriginal designer from Queensland, Australia. Her first collection made it on a runway less than five years ago. And last month, her latest collection reached Italy. A bunch of my girlfriends were all up at two o'clock in the morning, all glammed up,、uh, watch, yeah, watching the, the show. Marie Q. Couture debuted on the Emerging Talents Milan runway in Palazzo Visconti. Creed was the first Indigenous designer to appear on that runway. And she can still hardly believe it. This collection、um, kind of felt a bit of like, like a community collection because so, there were so many people involved in、uh, pulling the collection together, the raising of the funds.、Uh, look, I'm so grateful for all that. I, it, it wouldn't have happened. So I've been in the process of、um, thanking everybody. Um, you know, for their input in this, and、uh, I wouldn't have been able to get it on my own. Another Aboriginal designer in Australia is T. d e v a u who's only 14 years old. Her line, T. a n d b a l features Indigenous themed clothing. I feel like a lot of people usually just overlook Indigenous businesses, so for me to be where I am is just crazy, and I think it's really good because I'm also spreading. A lot of valuable information about Indigenous people. Since its conception a few years ago, it's expanded into homeware and accessories. She says the brand is about representing culture. I was not expecting like, all of this to just happen. The teen entrepreneur has some advice for those thinking about starting a new venture. I think really anything is achievable, no matter who you are, what age, like, what gender, you can do it. Rebecca Jarvie agrees that anything is achievable after her brand successfully took off in the middle of the pandemic. I describe myself as a fourth generation beater and sewer. And what that entails is my great grandma, she taught my grandma how to beat and sew, and my grandma taught my mom how to beat and sew. And I'm currently teaching my son how to beat and sew. So that generational knowledge is passed down in our family. Through the matriarch side. So I really take pride in sharing that. After sewing for friends and family, Jarvie started sewing regularly last year to produce as many masks as she could. Her most famous mask went viral on social media, and that helped her gain exposure. Recently, Jarvie teamed up with Airbnb to share Indigenous fashion with a diverse group of people. That helped her overcome her reluctance to talk about herself and the art she produces. It's not even about selling, it's also too about making connections and meeting people. You know, like some days, like when I don't get an email or nobody reaches out, then I kind of feel like sad. There are many unknowns when launching a business, but as these designers will tell you, just taking the first step is a step in the right direction. In Phoenix, Karina Dominguez, Indian Country Today. That's a slice of our indigenous world. We'll be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark t r a h a n Sometimes you've got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.